Linda, are we ready to go? Yes, we are. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm calling to order a special joint meeting of the Board of Retirement and the Board of Investment. Uh, it is Thursday, April 29th at exactly nine o'clock a.m. Uh, Linda has a few uh, comments to read and then we'll take a uh, roll call. Thank you, Chair Bernstein. This meeting is being conducted as a virtual meeting, so I will do a roll call of the trustees to confirm attendance. Mr. Kehoe? Byron it's it's Will. He said he would not be attending today. Um, okay, so uh, just a side note, Mr. Knox, Mr. Moore, Mr. Green, and Mr. Kehoe will not be attending the meeting today. Okay. Uh, okay, so now Mr. Kehoe. Mr. Santos? Present. Okay. Ms. Yeah. Ginsburg? Present. Mr. Bernstein? Here. Thank you. Ms. Gray? Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Oaken? Present. Thank you. Mr. Pryor? <coughs> I saw Mr. Pryor already. Mr. Robbins? Present. Thank you. Mr. Harris? Present. Thank you. Ms. Zapanta? Present. Okay. Ms. Greenwood? Okay. Mr. Jones? Present. Thank you. Mr. Morning. Kelly. Morning, Patrick. M Mr. Morning, Kelly. Ryan. Present. Ms. Sanchez. Here. Okay. So I show Mr. Knox, Mr. Moore, Mr. Green, Mr. Keogh, and Ms. Greenberg is absent. Um, staff participating in the meeting include the following. CEO Santos Kramen, Assistant Executive Officer JJ Popovich. Um, Roberta Van Nortrick, Training Coordinator and Project Manager, James Beasley, Supervising Administrative Assistant, HR Division Manager, Carl Carlina Toya, Interim Systems Manager, Kathy Delano, Delano, Ricky Contreras, Division Manager, Eugenia Durst, Senior Staff Counsel. Trustees, if you have comment or question on any item, please use the Zoom chat option to be placed in the queue. At this time, we ask all meeting participants to mute their mics until you're ready to speak. And now we may proceed with the agenda. Thank you so much, Linda. So two things, although we do have absences, we, have, uh, we do have quorums, items two and four call for action. We will be able to take action today. And, um, and additionally, and on a, on a more somber note, uh, I, I want to note uh, the unexpected and, and terribly sad passing of, of Lucera Stafford, Jill Rule. Uh, who, who passed away recently. Uh, it, it's a terrible loss. It's a terrible loss anytime, uh, but Jill was young and vibrant. Uh, she helped me many times. I know she helped you many times. I would note uh, a number of staff and trustees have requested that we adjourn today's meeting in her memory. And so without objection, we will be doing so. Um, uh, and obviously they'll be good at the order if people wish to add their own comments. Uh, we are now on to no, item two on the agenda, approval of the minutes. First, we have A, the approval of the minutes of the special joint meeting of the Board of Retirement of January. So moved. Moved by Oakham. Please don't be shy, we need a second. I uh, think second. everybody's muted. Yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> second. Second, Pryor. Uh, seconded, uh, I, I heard Pryor, I, I heard a couple, we'll give it to Will. We'll get a roll call, please. Sure, of course. Uh, Mr. Santos? No. Okay. Ms. Ginsburg? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Ms. Gray? Aye. Mr. Oakham? Aye. Mr. Pryor? Aye. Mr. Robbins? Aye. Ms. Zapanta? Yes. Thank you. We're done, so um, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We're now on to B, approval of the minutes of the special joint meeting of the Board of Investments of January 27, 2020. I'll move the minutes for the Board of Investments. I'll second. Been moved by Kelly and Mr. Ogham, you uh, actually can't second that motion, I believe. I'll need somebody uh, who is currently on the Board of Investments. Oh, okay. Uh, it's been seconded by Mr. Santos. Can I get a roll okay. call, please? Thank you, Mr. Santos. <laughs> Ms. Ginsburg? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. 
Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Yes. Okay, the motion passes with all trustees present. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now on to item three, public comment. I'm not aware of any uh, slips from the public. Linda, have any arrived? You are correct. There's no co uh, request from the public to address the board. Okay. Uh, we are on to item four, a non-consent item. It's a recommendation. Uh, because of uh, the Brown Act, there actually is a statement uh, that's short, but that needs to be read prior to our beginning of consideration of this item. Uh, so our, our HR head, uh, Carly Natoya, Dr. Carly Natoya has prepared this for me. I'm going to read it. Uh, according to Brown Act SB 1436 C3, prior to taking final action, the legislative body shall orally report a summary of a recommendation for a final action on the salary, salary schedules or compensation paid in the form of fringe benefits of a local agency executive as defined in subdivision D of section 3511.1 during the open meeting in which the final action is to be taken. And uh, now I'll make a statement of the recommendation, uh, which is that board chairs and vice chairs, which is Mr. Knox, Mr. Kelly, Ms. Gray, and myself, recommend to the board so that the CEO receive a 2% merit increase effective October 1st, 2020, and that he receive a 2.5% cost of living adjustment effective January 1st, 2021. There is no presentation, uh, but Dr. Natoya is available for questions or- I, I, I'll move, I'll move one, the item one, for the BOI. I move, uh, I second. Second, just one, one question. Did I read or I, I'm looking at now, does everybody get a two and a half cost of living uh, senior management or all staff um, or just uh, the CEO? It was all staff. It's all staff. Yes, sir. So the only thing we're talking about here is the 2% merit increase. Somebody second that uh, motion? So, uh, I second it for BOI. On the BOI was moved by Kelly and seconded by Sanchez. I still need a board of retirement motion. I'll, I'll, move, I'll move it for the board of retirement. Okay. Second, sir. Moved by Oakham and who seconded it? Mr. Pryor. Was that Pryor? Mr. Pryor, yeah. seconded by Pryor. Um, Mr. Sanchez, do you have a question? Yes. Um, It appears to me that in, in reading the um, the memo submitted that we that we kind of follow in the county's um, uh, wage increases for the employees, um, we all got a two and a half percent back in April. So if we're going to follow that pattern, why are we not providing to see uh, with a two and a half percent retroactive to uh, April of last last year, um, as well as the other two, uh, recommended October one and January one. Carly, do you want to take that, or I can answer that? Um, yes, we have our own union. Um, we we take in consideration what the county does, but we have our own union negotiations and the timetable that we were on. The um, the two and a half percent is effective January one. Right, so we all got, um, at least I got a two on a quarter, I believe. Um, Vivian can't um, disagree with me if that's not true. So, we did. Yeah, right. that's, that's county employees. We're Lacera, um, and Lacera has its own bargaining unit. So, okay. yeah, that's why, so that's the difference. He's getting consistent with all the other Lacera employees. Gotcha. Okay. I understood. I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Seeing no other questions, Linda, would you please take the roll calls? Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Santos? <clears throat> Aye. Ms. Ginsburg? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. Mr. Ms. Gray? Aye. Mr. Oakham? Aye. Mr. Pryor? Aye. Mr. Robbins? Aye. Ms. Zapanta? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously for the Board of Retirement. Uh, Board of Investment, um, Mr. Santos? Aye. Ms. Ginsburg? Aye. Mr. Bernstein? Aye. 
Mr. Jones? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Yes. Ms. Sanchez? Aye. Okay, the motion passes unanimously by all trustees present. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Carly, thank you for all your work shepherding this item through for us. Uh, appreciate it. We are now on to item five. Uh, we have a report. There will be a presentation uh, uh, and a discussion is needed uh, regarding uh, plans to uh, begin reopening uh, the boardroom for meetings. Uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Beasley and Ms. Van Nortwerk, but just to, to set the stage and to alleviate any concern that anybody might have, I, I do want to be clear, this plan is intended to go forward in June, but it is not a mandatory plan. So as you listen, please know uh, that uh, we, are, we are hopefully not pushing anybody individually past their own comfort level and at the same time proposing moving forward. But I will now allow um, the presentation to move forward. Thank you. Good morning, board chairs and trustees. It's hard to believe that a year ago, we were racing against time to cope with the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result of the pandemic, <clears throat> excuse me, your boards began meeting remotely on March 27, 2020 for board and committee meetings. Today, we will present how we have prepared the boardroom to return to in-person meetings and provide our recommendations related to this return. <clears throat> Excuse me, next slide, please. On April 5th, 2021, Los Angeles County moved into the orange tier of the blueprint for a safer economy. This move means that some of the restrictions have been lifted with caution, and yet some of the safety protocols remain in place. The remaining restrictions are found in the Los Angeles County's Department of Public Health order and that's particularly in the Protocols for Office Worksites Addendum, effective April 5th. In consideration of this addendum, Lacera's executive officers and the Business Continuity Team, or BCT, are cautiously moving forward in preparing the boardroom for your return. Next slide, please. The BCT has been busy assuring that the boardroom setup is compliant with the county's health order. This order strongly discourages in-person meetings unless it is absolutely necessary. But if it is necessary, there are certain requirements that must be met to be in compliance. It states that any meeting room will allow up for a maximum occupancy of 15 people. And that is granting that the space is large enough to allow those 15 people to exercise physical distancing of at least six feet from each other. It also requires the use of personal protective equipment, including a face covering that is worn over the nose and mouth at all times. The health order states that there is no eating or drinking in the meeting room and entrance to the meeting room should have the self-screening health questions posted and make available a means for temperature checks where feasible. So how do we adhere to these health orders? James Beasley will discuss the preparations that have been made to the boardroom for public meetings in adherence to the current health order. James. Thank you, Roberta. Next slide, please. The business continuity team has made several changes and additions to the boardroom in preparations for your return. Our first consideration was to address the physical space requirements within the boardroom. This was done by creating habitable maps that are based on seat placement and how public comment will be managed. For these changes and additions to the boardroom, we added a self-check thermometer at the entrance of the room along with a touchless hand sanitizer station. We also posted signage at the entrance, including requirements for wearing face masks and self-monitoring health questions that each person should ask themselves prior, in, prior to entering the boardroom. Inside the boardroom, we place face masks, social distancing, and maximum occupancy posters around the room to reinforce the public or the county's public health order requirements. Directional flow decals have been placed on the floor, directing the flow of traffic into and out of the boardroom, which I will discuss in more detail shortly. The next consideration was the cleaning protocols. A station with personal protective equipment has been placed in the back of the room, which includes face masks, face shields, hand sanitizer, and disinfected wipes. 
We also place san hand sanitizer and disinfected wipes around each seat at the dais. We added two HEPA certified air purifiers in the room, one located at the dais next to the trustees and the other one near the audience. The boardroom will be cleaned prior to the day of the board meetings and the, at the conclusion of each meeting. This includes wiping down the chairs, desktops, and common areas. The next consideration is what technology is required to conduct the hybrid meetings. Due to the habitable restrictions at the boardroom or in the boardroom, some trustees may choose to attend the meeting on site while others will continue to participate remotely. Those on site will participate using iPads so that the picture, their picture will be visible in a tile within the Zoom call, like you see now, and the sound will come through the boardroom speakers. If you are on site, you may choose to bring in your own personal device so you can access meeting documents. In, if you are participating remotely, you will continue to with the same process that you've been using. Since the meetings will still use Zoom, the recording of the meetings will not be affected. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier three habitable maps that we created. On this slide is the first map. As you can see, we added a directional decals that start the flow at the main entrance of the boardroom, directing people to follow a designated path to their desired location and eventually exiting the room at the side door near the computer station. Additionally, we removed all but 15 chairs from the room to adhere to the physical distancing protocols. Six of those chairs are around the dais for the trustees and possibly include a board assistant. Two of the chairs are at the presenter's desk for the CEO or CIO, depending on the meetings, and for the chief counsel. There's one chair for the deputy sheriff and one for system staff for technology support. The bench under the window has been made unavailable for seating due to dis disinfecting protocols. That leaves five available seats in the audience, which is totals 15 seats overall. So how does this add up? Again, there will be six around the dais, two at the presenter's desk, one system staff, one deputy sheriff, and five seats in the audience for a total of 15 people, which is the maximum number allowed by the county's current public health order. Each of the habitable maps are the same, except for the placement of the podium. In this map, the podium is located near the dais and adheres to the physical distancing of six feet. Next slide, please. This slide is one placed, is, is one that places the podium at the rear of the room near the large screen. Next slide, please. And the third one removes the podium altogether. <clears throat> In our recommendations for public comment, we will further explain the different locations for the podium. R Roberta will now discuss our recommendations in for in-person attendance, public comment, and presenters for the hybrid board and committee meetings. Roberta. Thank you, James. Next slide, please. When preparing our recommendations, we consulted with the executive office, legal, systems, and administrative services staff. We were also mindful of the LA County health order requirements related to meetings. So our recommendations are these. Based on our discussions with the board chairs, they indicated that they will be attending their meetings on site. So we recommend that the balance of the seats four or five, depending on whether the board assistant will be on site, will be filled with trustees using a rotational system if needed. The rotational process begins with a survey of the trustees conducted by the board assistants to determine who would like to attend the meeting on site. If the number confirming their desire to attend on site is greater than the number of seats available, then the rotational system will be used to determine who will attend and it will be based on whether those trustees have attended other board or committee meetings for that month. Those who have not will be granted priority over those who have. This will make it possible for all trustees who would like to attend the on-site meetings to do so on a rotational basis. Our recommendation as it relates to staff attending on-site meetings is that the CEO or CIO, depending on the meetings, and the chief counsel attend each on-site meeting. There will be two system support staff required, one in the audio-visual room and the other in the boardroom to manage the Zoom meeting. Next, our recommendations are related to public comment and staff and consultants making presentations. 
So let's begin with public comment. This will also include disability applicants and their attorneys. We've provided three recommendations for your board's consideration. The first is that those making public comment continue to do so virtually as has been the process for the last year. The second recommendation is that we provide the first floor workshop for the public to come to Lacera and make their comments using Zoom from there. So as you can see, recommendations one and two will not require the use of the podium in the boardroom. Recommendation three, <clears throat> excuse me, is to provide a staging area for the public in the first floor workshop. And then they'll be escorted by staff and the deputy sheriff to the boardroom, queued up outside of the boardroom while physical distancing and be invited into the boardroom at the appropriate time to address the board in person at the podium. In two of the habitable maps, we've included the podium, one near the dais and one with the podium in the back of the room. So to better support phys the physical distancing requirement, we recommend that the podium be placed in the back of the room if this option is selected by your boards. Depending on the open number of seats in the audience, those making public comment may be allowed to remain in the boardroom if they would like, or if they're not available seats, they will be escorted back to the first floor workshop or they may leave if they so desire. Next is staff and consultant presenters. We recommend that staff and consultants continue to make their presentations remotely using Zoom. But if the trustees would like for them to present in person at the meetings, then we recommend that they attend the board meetings as part of the audience if there's room. If there are not available seats, then they will queue up in the hallway while physical distancing and be invited into the boardroom as the time approaches to make their presentation. At the conclusion, they will exit the boardroom. Next slide, please. This is a quick look at how we have prepared the first floor workshop staging area for those with public comment. It's similar to the boardroom in that we place safety reminder posters and directional floor decals, a self-check thermometer, a touchless hand sanitizer, and posted the self-monitoring health questions for the safety of the public and staff. We remove the extra chairs and only 15 people may be in the meeting room at one time. Of those 15, one will be the deputy sheriff, one system support staff, and one staff to assist with escorting them to the boardroom, leaving 12 available seats in the audience. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we are requesting direction from your boards on these items. First, overall feedback and direction on returning to the boardroom. Next, in-person attendance of trustees and the rotational system. Third, the method for public comment. And last, how to manage presentations by staff and consultants. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. I, uh, I have people in the queue. First, Mr. Santos and then Mr. Kelly. Great, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm glad that we um, thinking about it. Just a, a, a couple of comments. Um, one, there's legislation um, going to the legislature up in Sacramento that would uh, permit the public to continue to appear uh, through Zoom. And what the rationale for that is that they, they have determined that the public uh, has better access when they have the ability to appear through Zoom. So there's something for us to um, kind of monitor that legislation and think about how we're going to, if that legislation is enacted, how we're going to operate. The, the other comment I have is that, unless I missed it, I, I don't didn't hear uh, what the plans are for the elevators, right? Because that's, you know, if you, if you get there at a certain time, there's going to be other people in the elevators. So I, I just don't remember either reading about it or hearing about what the plans will be for the uh, elevator and the, the capacity um, and, and who will be there to enforce that. Um, the other one, the other comment I have is that I think that we should be 
prioritizing our employees coming back to um, the office because that, that's our mission. Our mission is to provide services to the members. And so that, that to me is more important than, um, than the, the board coming back. I mean, I get it that we have to think about it and plan it, but to me, again, it's just, uh, we should prioritize the employees coming back. And the, the other issue is that um, the governor through an executive order, as we all know, uh, allow for the um, working from home and operating from home like we've been doing. So I, I don't see the governor lifting that or making any changes to that. And that's, that, that to me is, is critical because as long as we are able to operate the way we've been operating, um, it, 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 will, it will, to me personally, uh, I'm not ready to go back to uh, in-person meetings. Um, so why not wait to the, uh, the governor changes that uh, directive? You know, notwithstanding the fact that some of our colleagues do want to come in, um, that's okay. That it's okay. We just need to figure out how will that work. But um, anyway, so those are my comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Kelly. Then Ms. Gray. <clears throat> Mr. Kelly, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank staff for their work on this. It, it wasn't easy to, to do this, and I know it took some time and effort, and I thank you for that. Um, so my most material comments were following up on Mr. Santos. I think it's too early to discuss this, particularly in light of the governor's commitment to open the California economy on June 15th. And as part of that commitment, um, if you look at that plan from the governor, he really is... Um, talking about all industries across the state returning to normal operations, as he called it. But importantly to me, his plan permits increased capacity or numbers of persons allowed, including indoors with proof of testing or vaccination. And there was no reference in this document at all to either proof of testing or vaccination. And so my question for um, uh, uh, Carly and, and, and Joanna is, why, uh, I guess, has there been a dialogue at the agency about requiring vaccinations um, or, or proof, of, proof of testing with the test being negative? And the reason for that to me is um, La Sierra is a member organization where the great majority of the person-to-person -person interactions outside the boardroom are with members and predominantly retired members who are generally older persons um, and who mirror the, um, the, uh, the racial profile of, of, of this county uh, and ethnic profile with large numbers of them being from communities of color, which have been adversely impacted by the virus. So I'm interested in understanding if in fact, um, La Sierra is requiring staff to be vaccinated. And who wants to uh, answer that question? Joanna or Carly, I've been told. Carly, do you want to go first and, or do you want, sure. and then I, okay. Currently we are not requiring staff to be vaccinated. Um, it is, there's, there's a lot of considerations when making that call. First, we would have to um, monitor it. If we say that it's mandatory, we would have to monitor it and enforce it. Um, secondly, we're not quite prepared to maintain that type of medical data for all staff. Um, and additionally, as of the 15th, I think, of this month, maybe April 15th, most staff were, had just become eligible for vaccination. So um, it's a kind of fluid situation. And right now we have not made a conclusion that we should make it mandatory. Yes, and uh, yeah, that was a lot of consideration of where we are now. Um, as far as, you know, it's a legal issue, it's a policy <laughs> issue. Some of the legal issues that you have to look at is um, one, if you make it mandatory, um, there's to me a lot more hesitancy when it comes to that. Certain employers have, I mean, we know there's no federal, there's no state, there's no local mandate, right? 
Certain employers like the healthcare, you've seen it, agriculture, those that deal directly with the public. But if you look at other employers, the county, the superior courts, a lot of other employers have not adopted a mandatory program because there are legal risks. Uh, there's gonna be also, like I said, a lot of pushback. You're gonna get ADA issues. You're gonna get religious grounds. People are gonna bring up that they, they can't take the vaccination. And so then you're gonna have to implement what you're gonna do if they don't take it. I mean, when you weigh all the factors and then there's OSHA that says that if there's some uh, residual problems due to the vaccination, you're, it's work related. And so there, you're on the hook for that. So there's a lot of reasons why employers haven't gone that route. We have encouraged, we educate, we are telling people that, you know, and I, you know, I, from what I see, most people are, are getting it. And I think it's just a matter of time when it becomes more widely available. And maybe a few months from now, we do say more than just voluntary, but where we are now, I think, uh, you know, we've all met and talked about it and think this is the best, the best way. So why are we letting the, the potential um, uh, statements of what, what might be a few uh, guide, guide this policy issue? I don't doubt that some may object to it, but, it, but, but, but I mean, if you look at even data from like the Kaiser well, Family Foundation, there's a core group of folks who, who say, it's like seven or 8% who will say, I'll get, I'll get the vaccine, but only if my work or my school requires me to do so. Um, so it, it can provide also a benefit in terms of encouraging people to be vaccinated. There may be some, as you say, who may object because of um, ADA issues or other health related <clears throat> issues, but they're not assumed to be the majority. We have asked for people once they're vaccinated to let us know, but there's also litigation over mandates. I mean, the school district is being sued because it's, you know, the question is whether there's a license by the FDA or is it just an emergency, um, uh, what do they call it? It's an emergency order and whether that's sufficient. I mean, there's litigation right now mm -hmm. on whether you can mandate and uh, because there is no federal state or, or local um, order saying that you can mandate. It's it's an open issue. Well, I think the document should have included reference to the fact that, <clears throat> that folks had considered it um, and they were not implementing it for these reasons, but the, the document is completely silent on both testing for those who don't want to be who don't want to be vaccinated and or vaccination. So I am I am very nervous about going back to a boardroom where I do not feel comfortable, the great majority of folks have been vaccinated and that has been proved to, 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 to be true. Um, I don't think we need to rush. I think the staff should go before the board as Mr. Santos said, um, and maybe by then some of these other issues will have worked, will, will have worked themselves out. But I will continue to, um, to likely uh, uh, um, uh, attend these meetings through Zoom if possible, uh, just because of just because of not, uh, my own uh, uh, medical issue that puts me at high risk uh, from COVID, it does make me nervous. And thank you again to staff for all your hard work. I did appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Bernstein. Can I make a comment? Yes. So, um, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Santos, I appreciate I appreciate your comments. I think that in the development of this plan, uh, what we did was take into consideration what the current uh, constraints are and what the current um, uh, public health um, uh, mandates are. And so that's what you have before you. We felt that it was, uh, it was important that the program be voluntary, that we, we do understand that there is some hesitancy of individuals coming into the boardroom or, or traveling to Pasadena. I can uh, let you know that we, uh, we have um, uh, polled all of the individuals that would be providing support uh, in the boardroom all those that will be in the boardroom have um, have confirmed that they, they they have been vaccinated and will be fully vaccinated by the time we open up this voluntary program in June. So um, we uh, we took into consideration the uh, the the current uh, judicial issues that are coming before uh, the courts in terms of um, in terms of uh, uh, mandatory vaccinations. At this point in time, uh, we. We want um, people to voluntarily comply uh, and to report that out if they feel comfortable reporting that out. Um, there's some privacy issues as well. Um, we're not a school district where we, as a normal course of business, uh, require immunizations. Um, and so I'm a little uncomfortable with um, holding on to that sort of information from our staff, uh, quite frankly. It's voluntary. 
Um, we can continue operating uh, in a Zoom format the way we are. A hybrid format, I think, would uh, would would go a long way to reestablishing some normalcy for not only our staff, but the trustees as well. I do want to tell you also that we have been working concurrently, not only on the boardroom uh, return plan, but also for our employees returning. We've done a lot of work, uh, a lot of improvements um, in, in order for us to prepare uh, to return um, back to the, uh, to the office. I still plan on um, waiting um, at least that's my current um, my current commitment to the staff, and, and uh, I've, I've spoken to the board about that. That I, I'd like to open up sometime in September, just so that we get a little bit more um, uh, a little bit clearer uh, direction from the uh, the public health and from the courts. Quite frankly, about mandatory vaccinations and so on and so forth. And so we are. I think prepared, well prepared to bring our staff back. Um, I'm going to be asking some staff members to voluntarily come in sooner than September so that we can start testing some of the systems that we're going to have in place. So for example, we won't allow walk-ins, uh, our members to walk in any longer. They'll have to do um, uh, uh, an appointment, have to make an appointment before they come in. Uh, they'll have to answer certain questions. Um, you know, have they been vaccinated? What is their temperature? Have they been exposed? The, the, the questions that we normally ask at this point in time. So we're going to require that not only of our members coming back, but also our staff before they come in every day, we'll have to do that particular survey, answer those questions. They'll take temperature tests. Uh, if their temperature is too high, we'll ask them to go home and work from home until, uh, until they feel better. Um, and so we have all those measures in place. So I don't want you to think that we we thought about the boardroom first and then our staff second. We've been doing it concurrently. And I think we have a very, very good plan in place. This is a voluntary program. Um, I think that it's important for us to, uh, to begin um, moving in slowly, uh, but surely, um, but we do have to make some movement. And so that's the reason we, we ask for this voluntary program to go into place. And so I would, um, uh, we intend on, on, uh, on moving forward in June and offering this to all the trustees. Um, if they want to come in, we will, we will be ready for that. So thank you, Mr. Bernstein. Thank you. Um, I've got Mr. Oakham, then Ms. Gray. I, I think you hit a lot of my points, but I, um, it looks like May 15th, and I, I might have the wrong color. I think we're in the orange now. We'll be going to the yellow tier. Uh, is that correct for those that you've been working on this? We we'll go to the yellow tier. We're reading uh, that 60, 66%, two thirds of the seats can be filled at Dodger Stadium. You start going through all the events. And I don't think anybody should have to do what they don't feel like. You know, the worst thing for me is walking up those stairs. But uh, it would be nice to see people again. I'm pretty comfortable going outside, having lunch anywhere. Uh, we're still cautious when we don't know people with masks. But uh, I think the plan, you guys have done a very, very good job, but everybody has to be comfortable. Uh, and everybody's had different experiences, Mr. Santos. And we appreciate your reaction to what we're talking about. But I think we should go ahead with the plan and we'll see who volunteers to go upstairs. Uh, everybody in that room would be vaccinated. I don't think we should have presenters, okay, in the room. I think we should still be on Zoom to see what happens this summer. And then maybe in September, we can start moving other people uh, in the room. Could you confirm my initial understanding that presenters won't be appearing that Mr. Rickham's question has been answered already? Yes, the presenters will be uh, will be uh, making their presentations remotely. Yes. And from the first from the first floor. No, not that's public. Uh, presenters like professional staff, for example, or contractors, vendors, um, okay. fiduciary council will make presentations remotely in their, you know, in their living rooms or home offices or or, or where wherever they, they may be, or in their offices. 
The only thing I, the only thing I would say, uh, Mr. Crime and, and Mr. Bernstein, is that we have to start someplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we start someplace and everybody declines to go, that's okay, because you know, in June, July, as we move forward, we have to have a plan and we have to have the ability to execute the plan. And I, I think the plan is a good one. Thank you. And I just want to share uh, because uh, staff brought in Mr. Knox and myself to, to sort of see the system. Um, and it is my expectation that I'll be there when permitted. And I believe that's Mr. Knox's plan, although he's not here to speak for himself today, but that's my understanding. What I want to emphasize is staff has done a really great job of setting up the technology so that everyone has a, a, a screen into the Zoom. The, the feeling of connectivity, just so people know, was not simply with the people in the room. I, I felt equally connected to the people who were on the Zoom screen. So to me, it adds something. It, it doesn't pull people in the room out of this Zoom part. Uh, that was my experience. I just wanted to share that. Uh, and now I have other people in the queue, uh, Ms. Gray and Mr. Robbins. Thank you so much. Um, what stuck out to me in this memo was the LA County Department of Public Health statement, which says that in-person meetings are strongly discouraged in favor of virtual meetings. I appreciate, totally appreciate staff's work. And I think that it is important to always have a plan. Mr. Uh, Kreiman pointed this out um, when he first came to La Serra, looking for plans. What, what are our contingencies in case something happens? This is a little bit of the reverse. Um, this is how do we move from that contingency that we developed back to a normalcy. However, it, I'm having a, a little bit of a difficult time uh, balancing the um, effective statement from the LA County Department of Health that it's strongly discouraged. So I agree with Mr. Santos and a lot with Mr. Kelly, both of you, because of the fact that we're not quite ready to implement this. And what we are being offered <laughs> is really kind of an embellished Zoom meeting. You can Zoom here at, like I am at my dining room table or I can Zoom in the boardroom. Now the question becomes, am I willing to drive one hour to go Zoom when I can walk you know, so many steps to Zoom and comfortably have my cup of coffee, okay? So I'm a little, I'm just not ready. I'm also part of that class of highly vulnerable people because of my health conditions, my age, you know, I hate to admit it, I'm over, well, I'm closer to 70 than I am to 60. Um, I just, I don't feel comfortable at this time. And being in the orange tier is really what is sort of uh, getting to me, considering the fact that globally, we still have a severe pandemic that exists. And one of the problems is um, the ability to bring the virus back to the United States because of uh, the increase in travel. So I love having a plan. You've got to have a plan for almost everything. It's just that I believe based on uh, the updates and where we are, it's just too soon. And I think June is too soon because that's literally a few weeks away. I've got Mr. Robbins in the queue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree wholeheartedly with Ms. Gray's comments. Um, and I think that this is a viable plan and I, uh, I give Mr. Kreiman and everyone involved in putting this together the credit that they deserve. At this point in time, I'm probably going to opt to do what I'm doing right now. Um, I think until we can all meet together safely, um, I'm not interested in 
a lot for someone with a shorter drive than I do to go to Pasadena, especially dealing with the traffic. But I do have some comments about the whole issue of the vaccine. And I know the CSU and the UC systems about 10 days ago announced that in the fall, no one will be permitted on campus who is not vaccinated. And that's teacher, staff, and students. Mm -hmm. And I think the only thing that's going to stop that is the current temporary approval of the vaccine. But they will change that in the coming months. And then once the vaccine has uh, something other than an emergency temporary approval, then I believe my understanding of the law is it will give even the military who is not requiring the vaccine right now because of that, they will all then have the legal authority to mandate the vaccine. I want the vaccine mandated. This is not gonna go away until this bug does not have viable hosts out there. So, and I've done a ton of research on this and my wife's in an industry that's still decimated by uh, COVID-19, no meetings in the convention industry at all. So um, I would hope that we can mandate Lacerra employees unless they've got some super religious reason and I'm not up on all of that, but people need to get the damn vaccine. So that's all I need to say. Ms. Sanchez. Um, so thank you. So I, I agree with many of the comments actually that have been made, but I want to add a different perspective as well, which is the first thing that I thought about in terms of coming back was um, one of the benefits of having a Gaius and a, and a, a place where uh, we meet is to be able to offer the public access to us in the form of public comment because we are here as a public agency doing the public good. And the, the, the big concern that I had was that I didn't want to be seen as um, in any way kind of keeping the public from coming by uh, or sort of restricting access to the public. And as Mr. Santos mentioned, you know, that, that um, there was this desire to maintain the ability to call in to make public comment. Um, we have seen an impact, by the way. We've certainly seen more public comment than normal, um, but that is part of our part of what we do. And I, I um, wonder that if we choose to come back earlier than even in in just a sort of embellished Zoom format, I wonder the impression that it may seem as though we may or may not be willing to interact with the public. And if we are willing to, I feel like it presents a level of risk that I think a lot of people aren't comfortable with. And so that element of it and that decision actually has a, an optical uh, element as well that we have to consider. Um, you know, I, I think that most businesses um, are looking at fall at the earliest, but in many businesses are actually looking at next year. Um, in order to bring um, their employees back um, by requirement. And so, you know, it's just sort of something that we have to think about um, as well. Mr. Harris. Well, like Ms. Sanchez, I do agree with virtually all the comments were made. Um, I do appreciate Mr. Robbins being willing to allow me to take his place in the boardroom However, I'm going to respectfully decline that invitation. Uh, I have no intention of coming back uh, until uh, the LA County Department of Public Health says it's safe to do so. Um, I do, I really do appreciate you having a plan um, and all the hard work that's gone into this. I know this isn't something you just kind of throw out there and, you know, on a whim. A lot of work went into that and I appreciate the diligence with which it was put together. And it is a good backup plan, but that, uh, I just don't see any reason to rush this at all. Uh, so I'll be, uh, I'll be zooming from Sierra Madre. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Great. I believe that is all then for this item. Thank you staff very much. Um, we are on to items for staff review six. Linda? Um, I don't have any items. And we are on to good of the order. Would you uh, call the roll and, and the key personnel, please? Absolutely. Um, Mr. Santos? 
Madison, thank you. Ms. Ginsburg? Nothing, thank you. Ms. Gray? Um, I have had trouble processing the loss of Ms. Rawal. Um, I came into contact with her quite a bit. Um, it started out when Sackers first had a session uh, related to uh, women leaning in and it had to do with that book. And, and Jill went out and bought the book and read through it and had all of these plans for us, uh, well, for the women at La Serra. And we were going to, we had a lot of plans. We were gonna do some things just for women with respect to uh, upward mobility within La Serra, uh, personal development. Um, but what I appreciated was the energy and the fervor that she exhibited with regard to her role at La Serra, her role as a woman. She was extremely vibrant. Um, it, this struck me very, very hard. I mean, you know, being an attorney also, I can only imagine what the legal staff is going through and those who have come in contact with Ms. Rowell um, from helping us with our Form 700s to, you know, other questions um, to just laughing. She was a wonderful woman and I miss her tremendously. My prayers go out to all of the staff at La Serra from top to bottom and in between that are having problems processing this um, because I'm certain that members of this particular board who also um, interacted with Ms. Rawal are affected by it. Um, I was shocked. Um, and so I just, I am so happy that we're going to adjourn in her honor, but I truly have wonderful memories of that woman. She's just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Oakham? I have nothing, thank you. Mr. Pryor? Well said, Ms. Gray, and I have nothing past that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Robbins? You're muted, Les. Um, sorry about that. Um, two quick things for those that don't know how to get the vaccine. I can tell you the city of Long Beach at the convention center is giving it out every day. The lines have all but gone away, both walk-up lines and drive-through lines. Anybody 16 and above can get vaccinated. They don't have to live in the city. Um, get the vaccine. Um, secondly, I, I'm very much in agreement with uh, Vivian's comments about Jill. Um, I lost a daughter five years ago, and I know exactly, and she was 36 years old, so it's tough, and it's, um, it's you know, it, it hit me hard. She obviously worked with the uh, insurance benefits and ledge committee on health on healthcare issues and stuff, so um, just another tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Robbins. Um, Mr. Harris? Well, I share all the comments about Ms. Rawal, and it is a terrible, terrible shock and saddens me greatly. That's it. Thank you. Ms. Zapanta? Okay. Mr. Jones? Uh, no comment. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes, thank you, Vivian, for sharing that. That was very nice. I am, I think we we're very lucky to have Jill uh, with us. And uh, I always thought she had a really beautiful voice. That's the first thing that ever struck me about her. It was very commanding. And I remember the first time I heard her thinking, oh, I'm lucky she's with us and she's not a voiceover actor because <laughs> that's, how, that's how really beautiful her voice was. Um, but it, it's it's a sad um, event, and she was she was very much a beautiful woman. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Miss Sanchez. Um, I I also would like to um, 
share my own memory. I fret every year, as everyone knows, over my Form 700. Uh, and so Joe is my nearly my best friend when, <laughs> at those moments. So um, I think I'm going to fret more next year. Thank you. Um, Ms. Fontenot? Hi. Sorry. Yeah, um, it has been very tough for the legal office and I appreciate all the comments uh, that you all shared about Jill and, um, and I thank you Vivian for describing her so perfectly. <laughs> um, but uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, it has been, been very difficult for, for all of us. It's a small division. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Popovich. I um I, I wanted to thank all the trustees um, for their comments uh, and uh, their memories of Jill. Um, it's uh it's never easy to lose um, you know uh, employees uh, in especially in an organization like Lacera because uh, so many of us work together for so long that you are not just employees anymore. You're really family. And um, so losing family is, is um, a whole nother level than just losing a, an employee or, or, or a friend. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think that's the way that a lot of people looked at, uh, at Jill is uh, she was a member of our family. And uh, so I, I really appreciate the comments. Um, it's a difficult time for many here at La Serra. Uh, this is the second individual we've lost in a short period of time. And um, we just have to, uh, uh, remember people in the best light that we can and celebrate their lives uh, and move forward and be grateful for the time that we got to know them. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kreiman. Yes, um, I just wanted to thank um, all the trustees and for uh, your comments about Jill and uh, also for your concern uh, that you show for the, the mental and emotional well-being of my staff. I know it's been a very difficult uh, it's been very difficult for all of us to try to wrap our head around it because um, she was a very important part of, of La Serra. So thank you for that. And um, personally, I'd also like to just say thank you to all the trustees for your support um, of, of me over the last 18 months or so. I, I, I appreciate um, everything that you all have done. Um, and it's been, it's been a great, um, experience and I'm looking forward to uh, to providing even more and better service to La Sarah and our members moving forward. So thank you very much. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Bernstein. Uh, everyone has spoken so eloquently and well, and, and I so appreciate the comments. Um, I, I, uh, I echo them. I don't have anything to add uh, except to extend in addition to my sincere condolences to us here at Lissera, to, to Jill's family. What a terrible loss. Um, uh, that, that's all I have to say. Um, and uh, with that, Linda, we're done with good of the order? Yes, we are. Uh, again, we will be adjourning in, in Jill Rule's memory, and I would be happy to entertain a motion to adjourn. I'm moved. Without a second. Second.